Hi, I'm Codex. I made you a mixtape. You a fan of Pitbull? I'm the world's biggest Pitbull fan. First track, Pitbull, Feel This Moment, featuring Christina Aguilera. You ever hear this? It goes like, da na 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 Wait, that sounds familiar. I've heard this before. Da na 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 na. Isn't that Take On Me? You know, the 1985 hit by AHA, Take On Me? Was that a sample? It didn't feel like one, but Pitbull didn't copy Take On Me note for note either. Why was AHA's melody used in Feel This Moment? Was that like a reference or something? Whatever. Next track. Rita Ora and Eamon Bank. Bang Bang. Bang Bang na 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 Bang Bang na 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 Was that Crazy Frog? That was a sample! But it wasn't a sample! Vanilla Ice? Robin Thicke? Every track on my pop tape is referencing another pop song! Interpolation. The use of a melody from an existing piece of music in a new song. You've probably had this happen to you too, right? Sometimes a pop artist will just sing another pop artist's melody, and you're just sitting there like... What did I just hear? I seem to hear this stuff everywhere on pop radio, yet I've never really thought about it before. The reality is that interpolation is a lot more complex than that. Songwriters have held camps picking apart songs of the past for current artists to use. Lawsuits and legal restrictions have set industry shocks and kept tight tabs on how music is sampled and recontextualized. So when it comes to pop music, where do you draw the line when pop songs start referencing other pop songs? We're gonna dive deep. We're gonna start thinking about how melodies are created and reused and resampled and reused and resampled and reused and resampled and reused and resampled. Chances are you've heard this before. Remember that Rita Ora track from earlier, Bang Bang? Well, I was wrong. Crazy Frog didn't even make that melody. The original melody is, in fact, Axel F by Harold Faltermeyer. Faltermeyer originally wrote Axel F for the 1984 film Beverly Hills Cop, but it's been remixed and interpolated by over 40 different artists, including Crazy Frog and Open Gangnam Star. Sai? on the 2002 track, Champion Made for the FIFA World Cup? So a song from 2021 uses a melody for an 80s cop film, which has also been used for FIFA, made by the Gangnam Style Man, and has been sung by an animated frog. What planet am I on? The podcast Switched on Pop gives an insane rundown of Axel F, along with many other crazy interpolations on their episode Invasion of the Vibe Snatchers. Here's another example that they use. The whistling on the One Republic song, I Ain't Worried, created for this year's film Top Gun Maverick, is similar to Peter Bjorn and John's Young Folks. But the whistling on Young Folks is similar to Home by Edward Sharp and the Magnetic Zeros. And Pumped Up Kicks by Foster the People. And Tighten Up by the Black Keys. Switched on Pop brings this full circle by mentioning that Harold Faltermeyer was the writer of the original Top Gun anthem. Everything that I've ever listened to is a lie! Music is a lie! It's a big, stupid lie!
I think I'm being too judgmental. It's easy to dismiss interpolation as lazy stealing done to get an easy melody, but look at the web of influences that it weaves. A number of different artists referencing different periods, each with its own melodic context. Interpolation has always been about borrowing melodic influence. What matters in the history of interpolation, though, lies in the hit. The history of the hit. The hit. In case you don't know, here's a little Music 101. Music 101, Melody. A melody is a collection of musical tones that are grouped together as a single entity, and most compositions consist of multiple melodies working in conjunction with one another. The melody is formed when pitches are combined for the song's time signature for the score. Harmony is the sound of two or more musical notes heard simultaneously, which can be arranged for different parts including soprano, alto, tenor, and bass. Okay, got it? Good. In his book, The Song Machine, Inside the Hit Factory, John Seabrook uses the term hit factory to describe teams of talented songwriters hired to create music based on listener tastes. The New York Tin Pan Alley-based publisher T.B. Harms, one of the largest and earliest music publishers, included aficionados such as Jerome Kern and George and Ira Gershwin. However, T.B. Harms merely composed for piano players. The first hit factory of the vinyl record era, Don Kirshner's Alden Music, was a team of artists and managers that crafted Brill Building Pop, a catch-all genre describing early teen idols of the 50s and 60s. Rock and roll and R&B eventually saw breakout hits such as Big Mama Thornton's Howlin' Dog, penned by Jerry Lieber and Mike Stoller. Hit Factory saw teenage acceptance of rock and R&B as big opportunities. Elvis Presley, whom you may associate with Howlin' Dog, recorded it in 1956, and it topped both U.S. pop, country, and R&B charts for a record 11 weeks. You ain't nothing but a dog, As a matter of fact, Big Mama Thornton's original song went on to be covered by over 250 artists. So why might we associate Hound Dog so much with Elvis's cover and not Big Mama Thornton. It's Elvis. Apparently, Teenage Appeal is a big seller. As Seabrook mentions, rock and R&B songs were, quote, written for the new teen market. The lyrics embodied teen themes. Young love, fun, fast cars, dancing, and they were generally less sophisticated than, say, the songs that TV Harms published. Look at the lyrics to another classic Elvis cover, Little Richard's Tutti Fruity. Do you know how to love me? Yes, indeed. Oh, boy, you don't know what you do to me. Tutti Fruity. You might read Tutti Fruity and associate it with... Uh, liking a woman a lot. It also became evident that not only the artists had celebrity behind them. In the 60s, Phil Spector and the Wrecking Crew hired Brill Building songwriters Ellie Grenwick and Jeff Barry for Wall of Sound hits. Motown Records manager Barry Gordy equipped the famous Holland Dozier Holland songwriting team to write for Detroit soul icons such as Marvin Gaye. The point here is that hitmakers wrote many of the most iconic hits for the most classic periods of countercultural music. They were, dare I say it, Vibe Snatchers. Hit factories know that nostalgia has a big role in determining taste. Nostalgia is especially effective if you're fond of R&B, rock, and, let's not forget, boy bands. Radio led to mass audience expansion, and something else was brewing. Money was meant to be made. In the 90s, Motown produced neo-soul acts like Johnny Gill and boy bands such as Boys to Men, but the boy band craze was possibly due to new influence from Gerald Busby, Gordy's successor after Polygram Records purchased Motown's catalog in 1993. Motown wasn't unique. Labels sell their catalogs to move business, and these deals often include artists' catalogs, too. Marvin Gaye, for example. According to Variety, Gaye's estate collateralized more than 200 of his songs in 2000, totaling a hundred million dollars worth of bonds. Dealmaker David Pullman worked with Gay's estate because of his 1997 Bowie Bonds deal, where David Bowie raised 55 million dollars by promising investors that they would earn income generated by 25 of his albums. Pullman wrote similar Bowie Bond type deals for other iconic artists, including the Isley Brothers and James Brown. Ever since hip-hop became the most consumed genre on the radio, Investors have been able to buy the catalog rights to the genre's most important musical influences, many of which include rock and R&B artists, with the belief that their iconic songs with iconic melodies would be able to earn them major money. It's no surprise that these investors began interpolating their newly acquired melody assets into new songs. 
gotta get up. Did I mention Marvin Gaye? In 2015, Robin Thicke and Pharrell Williams paid Gaye's estate for infringing on the copyright of Got to Give It Up for their song, Blurred Lines. Courts upheld that Blurred Lines' chord progressions were too similar to Got to Give It Up. That's why I'm This is a classic case of industry shock, a message regarding policies for record labels. The vice president of A&R for Epic Records, Ezekiel Lewis, reported to Rolling Stone that, quote, for blurred lines, the writers didn't credit the inspiration, and thus we had a gray area. Post-blurred lines people are being overly cautious about clearing samples and interpolations even down to drum sounds. Now, hitmakers need to buy the rights to a melody. Songwriters were forced to ask themselves, how can they interpolate nostalgic hits into new songs under these provisions? Ethan Millman attended a songwriter's compound for his 2021 Rolling Stone piece, No Shelf Life Now, the big business of interpolating old songs for new hits. For three days, two dozen songwriters, producers, and publishing executives asked themselves how they might best transform melodies by Stevie Nicks and Bob Marley into hits for the likes of Doja Cat, Ariana Grande, and Cardi B. Franny Graham, vice president of indie publisher Primary Wave, reflected that these old hits were acquired after Primary Wave went on a buying spree, with the knowledge that these iconic hits would drive streams. Graham recalls one instance in which Primary Wave had three different writers' rooms, each room trying to interpolate the same 90s hit, Closing Time. And as Primary Wave president Justin Shukat told Vulture, six or seven interpolated versions of Closing Time reached the studio before settling on one version, thought it was by Ian Dorr. Closing time, I lost my mind. It's common knowledge that the pop artist you're listening to sometimes isn't making the beats or writing the hooks. But if you hear an interpolated song like Howlin' Dog, Closing Time, or Blurred Lines, and you feel that warm, fuzzy, nostalgic feeling, that's because a hitmaker probably wrote it that way. Now, you may be wondering, what's the difference between interpolation and sampling? Sampling. Sampling uses the pre-existing recording of a source for a new song. Um, actually, when you say that Robin Thicke sampled Marvin Gaye, you're technically wrong. Shut up. This cute little PDF by the US Copyright Office summarizes legal differences between sampling and interpolation. Interpolating a musical work is different because it does not involve using any of the actual audio sounds contained in a pre-existing recording. This is because, under US copyright law, the exclusive rights in sound recordings do not extend to making independently recorded sound-alike recordings. That is a cover, and for a cover, you need to secure a copyright through what is called a statutory or compulsory mechanical license. A statutory license states that no copyright owner cannot normally say no if all legal requirements are satisfied. Even then, you need to consider who's eligible for the license or how much royalties are paid to the artists. We normally associate sampling with hip-hop, so let's look at an example of hip-hop that the U.S. Copyright Office actually provides in this same document. Nas's I Can. I know I can. Nas interpolates Beethoven's Fu release. Alternate reality number one, sampling. If Nas were to stroll into a record store, pick out a recording of full release that was recorded by my grandma, headed back to the studio, and then made the beat with my grandma, my grandma's getting a paycheck. Alternate reality number two, interpolation. Instead of paying that money to license my grandma's recording, Nas would be better off just getting someone else, avoiding that finder's fee, and not paying my grandma. I'm being dramatic, but you get the idea. You need a copyright to obtain a sample, but only for the recorded material. Go ninja, go ninja, go. Case in point, Vanilla Ice, the, the coolest, coolest rapper, rapper alive. alive, got flack for his 1991 single, Ice Ice Baby. which famously lifted the bass riff on Queen's Under Pressure featuring David Bowie. Okay, Ice. My boy. 
How is it different? Ding 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 ding. That's the way theirs goes. Ours goes ding 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 ding. That little bitty change. It's not the same. The fourth beat of Ice Ice Baby's bass line has one additional eighth note, or in Ice's words, that little bitty change. That little bitty bit. Ding 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 ding. That little bitty bitty. But it didn't matter. Didn't pay to use it. Ice didn't license the 1981 recording of Under Pressure, so he didn't sample it. Ice never asked to use the bass line, so representatives from both Queen and David Bowie threatened a copyright infringement suit. Ice settled out of court, and Queen and David Bowie now have both royalties and songwriter credits on Ice Ice Baby. This is what we mean by when a sample is cleared. But a hip-hop artist who wasn't so lucky, though, was Biz Marquis. Grand Upright Music v. Warner Brothers Records Inc. ruled that Biz never cleared the Gilbert Sullivan song alone again naturally for his song Alone Again. I'm alone again naturally. What makes Biz any different than Ice? Well, Ice re-recorded Queen's bass line. Biz merely sampled the original recording without talking with O. Sullivan beforehand. The one thing that I'm very guarded about is protecting songs, and in particular Alone Again. I'll go to my grave defending the song and make sure that it's never used in a comic scenario. You hear stories of this happening all the time. Samples don't get cleared, and as a result, lawsuits and songwriting credits suddenly become war at one another. But it's set a precedent because I think it was the first time the sampling case had come to court. There have been cases before, but they've been settled out. But hey, maybe with the flexibility of the internet, copyright laws can get a little more forgiving for creative interpretations of recorded sound. Look at fair use, the permitted use of copyrighted material without permission. Huh. According to the 1976 Copyright Act, any works made after 1978 are copyrighted protected for 70 years after the author dies. You are all criminals. You can only sample Thomas Edison's wax cylinders, you thief. <laughs> this is such a stupid moral dilemma. It's a bunch of people putting money behind art, so it's masquerading as a moral dilemma. A, mo a moral money dilemma. So if courts decide that sampling is stealing and interpolation isn't, then what's the solution? I'm gonna share a little personal piece of myself with you here. So, I have Polish grandparents, and every year my family sings Happy Birthday both in English and in Polish. Everybody knows Happy Birthday, right? <clears throat> happy Birthday to you. Happy Birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Dame. Happy birthday to you. In Polish, we sing a song similar to Happy Birthday called Stolot, and Stolot goes like this. Stolot, Stolot, Jezi, Jezi, Jenam. Stolot, Stolot, Jezi, Jezi, Jenam. Jezerac, Jezerac, Jezi, Jenam. Jezi, Jenam. But the part in the song which we always forget the lyrics to is that last line. Jezerac, Jezerac, Jezi, Jenam. So year after year, my family has just been progressively forgetting that last line. And at the end of every frickin' Stolots, we just mumble like Nezerats, Nezerats, To me, that's exactly what interpolation feels like. My family knows that we mean to celebrate a birthday when we sing Happy Birthday, but when we sing Stolots, it's the melody that's guiding us through the birthday idea, not the lyrics. I admit that there is no solution to borrowing ideas. Interpolation can work both ways, depending on how you view it. Interpolation seems to be used for good when some creative aspect of the original song is tweaked and your nostalgic is authentic, and used for evil when it's just a stand-in using your nostalgia as filler. However, what merit do we define that by? 
we shouldn't consider borrowing an idea to be derivative. We shouldn't look down on sampling as stealing, either. The recurring problem with interpolation is everything else that permeates the beauty of music. Money, lawsuits, blah blah blah, the restrictions on creativity held by law. So, sure. Nothing is original, everything is fake, but what's bad about that? Art is subjective, and we have, at this point in time, the largest availability of music at our disposal. You can make up a mashup of Big Mama Thornton and Crazy Frog if you want to. When you've given up, and when you throw on a song and get inspired to rip off something yourself, and when you decide to borrow someone else's ideas too, just remember, you've heard this before. That's the way there's a ghost. That's the way a little bit change. It's not the same.